Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Okay. So, I'm Craig. I'm an alcoholic. Thanks, Christine, for asking me to come. I was here last month to hear a friend, and uh, I've known Christine for a long, long time. Um, I'm coming up on 18 in August, and but my first couple of years, my, my, you know what? We all have. We're, I have one day like you do. You know, I've done it like for 18 years that way, but it wasn't easy. I mean, I had to go scream on the mountaintop. When I was so my first two years. Because I couldn't figure this out. I didn't know. And I just knew I felt, you know, after my 90 days, because I had 90 days, and that was like a whole new thing. Because I had been, you know, I I went to a party in uh, 1968 or whatever, 69, and I left in 2002. And for 36 years, it worked. Pot, wine, beer, occasionally hard stuff. Occasionally, you know, I grew up with the Beatles. Uh, they did marijuana, I did it, they took acid, I took acid, you know. And I was in the music business, and it just was, it was, you know, a fun time growing up. And it seemed to work for a long, long time. Um, I was a recording artist on Warner Brothers, I had an album out in 1980, another record in CBS. And, uh, but it didn't go, and that was the end, for me, my whole life was built around that. That was my higher power. I had married my childhood sweetheart that I met in 11th grade and we were together for 30 years we had two children and she left me uh, like uh, 20 years ago so um, not because I was active in what brought me here I was my behavior I couldn't see it then uh, and uh, so I was very betrayed by God I was a choir boy I was a PTA guy, you know, and I felt like, God, you know, I was a faithful husband. How could you do this to me, God? You know, and what I learned here in this program is God gives us all a free will. He didn't do nothing to me. He gave her a free will. She got tired of my crap and threw me out. And, and, you know, I was heartbroken. That was the end of my life. And I didn't care anymore. I was depressed. And I started going, you know, I couldn't even drink or use for a while. But eventually, I got back into cocaine, and then I I didn't want to hurt my nose, so I learned how to cook it. And uh, it didn't take long for me uh, to get financially, uh, spiritually, emotionally just broken. I I couldn't exist without it. I would be waiting. And I'm a depressive as well, so I never knew when I was a, a kid before I smoked weed, I was very serious. I had a duodenal ulcer, you know, and then somebody popped a joint in my mouth, and I was okay for a lot of years. But, you know, eventually it caught up to me. And so I, um, uh, I, I hit a bottom at 50 years old. My son was 20. He saw me, just to give you a little, my drunk a lug. Uh, definitely an alcoholic. I didn't know it at the time, because all my brother-in-law's back east, or, you know, they drink heavy. And, um, and, and, all my friends. We all drink. I, you know, I'm a good drinker. I can drink people under because I have a high tolerance. But I didn't ever consider myself an alcoholic. But now that, that I got here, I see I'm a blackout drinker. I passed out. Matter of fact, my wife and I had bought our first Honda Accord. It was beautiful. It was uh, 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 93. We had a 94 before it was even. It was like December. It was before it was even like really out. Everybody's looking at three days later. I passed out at the wheel and. And I almost ran into an apartment complex at Valley Vista and uh, Sepulveda. And something saved me. And the guy said he heard me screaming all the way down. And it stopped at the curb. It was the first year the engine dropped. And I was totally, I got out of the car. I only had the one seatbelt that came over automatically. I didn't have the lap belt. And I had, to, my chest was so sore. And I called the police. The police were driving by and I called them over. And they looked. The curb wasn't even that. Like it was, I was that guy, like three feet from the front door. I would have killed somebody in their sleep. And, uh, you know, I was a little sick. Um, uh, I had a cold and I had an old friend from Philly and we were drinking heavy. And, uh, 
you know, I I asked the cop to lock me up because my wife's going to kill me. Her mom was coming out the next day from Philly. And so I wound up, oh, and when I, in bed, she did. She was so bad. And I wound up running them a nice Mustang convertible, and they went out to San Simeon. And everything worked out. The insurance, I said it was a dog. There was nobody reporting it. The cops, they breathalyzed me. I was like, I don't know, 1.5. I was enough to definitely be over. And, uh, you know, hey, there's definitely something watching over you, you know. And if your wife ain't glad you're alive, you, you, she don't deserve, you know, whatever. But at any rate, that was my first thing with, and that was before I got in the program. Anyway, so I'm the guy you hear to treat people. Well, I wasn't going to have any of that. I was on the roof at 3 in the morning with BB guns and extending, uh, you know, uh, because I they were watching me. They were watching me watch porn and whatever in a tent in my living room. Because, and I just couldn't, like, how can this be happening? Anyway, they call it tweaking. I never did crystal meth, but I did enough of that where sleep deprivation got in there five days up. But I can't tell you how many times I passed out the wheel. I lost my car one night from being so drunk. Uh, uh, and I, I had, I, well, I, I knew I was going to get pulled over some. I was just, and it was maybe within a mile of the house, but I didn't remember. And I had to just go up and down streets. What a way to live. I mean, I'd go, driving because they were watching me in my home i mean i actually did crazy things like go to the adult store where the little booths are and i'd be smoking cigarettes and i'd have my crap and a guy that worked here says are you crazy what do you do you know there's cops you know people are getting busted and uh i didn't care you know i just wanted to be left alone i walked into the cop station barefooted with a videotape of them and it was just insanity. I called the army. I, I mean, it's it's still real to this day. It was so such a crazy story. I, I don't have time to get into it. But anyway, my 20 year old, because I was a, a recording artist and all, my 20 year old, they got me help. They and they, that through a musician's assistance program, they put me in uh, a recovery for 30 days. It was Pasadena recovery, which is actually a nice place now. But then it had just been converted from a convalescent home. And, man, I'll tell you, it smelled like a convalescent home. It was not a nice place. And I wanted to get out of there. My son was 20. He said, Dad, I'll never speak to you. You know, like, I did it for my kids. And, uh, you know, uh, eventually, uh, a guy that worked there, uh, a counselor, he was in the business, on the, on, the music, on the business side of the music business. He came up and talked to me, told me his story, and I could really relate. And then I started to go to outside meetings, and I started to hear the language of the heart. I liked it the way we talk here. I started to do something. I went to all the meetings, N-A, C-A, you know, M-A, you know, and I, I, I but I really loved A-A because it, I loved the literature. Uh, it was more God-oriented. And so, you know, it's all addiction, alcohol addiction, drug addiction, but there's so many isms that Robert, Robert, you did a great job. This is a great guy here. And, you know, we've become very good friends and he really is going for this. You know, we can't, half measures avail us nothing. You know, it's, it, it's, and this is a hard thing, I want to tell you stuff in the literature that is the truth, because the literature is where the truth is. Our founder knew us really well. He was very honest when he wrote the big book in the 12 and 12. And, you know, the thing is, is we're basically willing. Those that do not recover are people that cannot or will not completely give themselves to the simple program. I don't know about you, but I'm a will not. I will not do this. I didn't do a four-step for the longest time. I just hated the idea of, like, a report. Matter of fact, when I finally did a four-step, I put my four-step on it. That's how much I resented it. So, yeah, I resent having to do this. It's true, because I didn't feel part of the club. Like, I just never felt. So, you know, um, but I did it like the message, and I've been along to this, this prime time, and, and uh, her and I used to be part of this Gorley in the park meeting, and I used to cook for it. I was a good cook, so I'd bring eggs, bacon, potatoes. Now they make it there. But, I mean, that kept me sober. There's maybe six of us back then. But I was dying because I was restless, here and I'm a little discontented, and I couldn't figure it out. I wanted this so bad. See, the big book says the liquor was but a, but a symptom. And then we had to get down the causes and conditions. And so, you know, there's a lot of factors. It, it is a spiritual program. Don't let the God word scare you. I mean, you might already have a particular idea, but the big book is so open 
And I grew up in a church, and I was very into it. And I'm, it's not that I'm not, but AA allowed me to put down all my old ideas about a punishing God, a vengeful God, a spiteful God, and find a new way of looking at it through Emmett Fox's Sermon on the Mount, which is where our program came from. This is metaphysics and how to think rightly. Right thinking versus wrong thinking. I don't know about you. You know, right now, um, you might be thinking about what you're going to eat later. I can't wait till this meeting's over. I hate this guy. I can't stand what he's saying. Uh, what's he talking about? You know, that's... Uh, see, this is what I do. I have these opinions, and I take them as truth. And so, you know, judge not or you should be judged. It's not just on the outside. It's what, it's what I do inside. You know, do unto others as you have them do unto you. That's the golden rule. Treat others as you'd have them treat you. But the, the, the fourth, the, the fourth dimensional, the spiritual application is to think of others as you'd have them think of you. And this is hard. In, in my consciousness, my secret place of the most high, this is where everything is. Everything on the outside manifests from what I produce in here. And as an alcoholic with untreated alcoholism, Nothing's good. I wake up in the morning and everything sucks. There's no God. I hate you. I hate you. I don't like this program. I don't like these steps. I don't like nothing. Why am I an alcoholic? Why me? Why me? You know, it's always me, 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 right? And so this is, a, I was just talking to this gentleman here about it's a disease of selfishness. You know, the big book says that liquor was but a symptom. But selfishness, self-centeredness, that is the root of our troubles driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity, we step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate, sometimes seeming without provocation. But sometime in the past, we made decisions based on self that later placed us in a position to be hurt. So this is gets into resentments of the number one offender, the reason we have a four-step. The first thing we do is a resentment inventory. And everyone thinks it's just about the writing, but the most important thing, and um, Christine and I are in the same sponsorship family. I need to forgive all those people. If I w it, the big book says on 66, if I was to live, I had to learn to master these resentments. And they give you a, like a one-time prayer. We pray for everyone two weeks. If you miss a day, you got to start over. God, I resent the shit out of this motherfucker. <laughs> May he have health, prosperity, and happiness. And everything I wish for myself be given to them as well. You see, it says, even if you don't mean it, even if you don't really want it for them, do it anyway. Do it every day for two weeks. And I, when, at this meeting, there was an old man, Pat. He was an actor. He's been in some He was great. And I didn't have the steps in place yet. And there was a guy that was threatening me and building a studio. At my, you know, and they were ripping me off. And I just, he used the big book against me. And I wanted to kill him. I was literally, you know, to think murder is to murder. This is what, what is said. So he gave me this thing, and I practiced it. And I'll tell you what, I I learned to accept, forgive him. It, it left me. A year later, I heard he was in Hawaii, and I got a resentment. Oh, there he is with my money in Hawaii. And then a week later, I heard he was dead on a piece of cardboard, overdosed. And, you know, I didn't go to, good, he got his. No, I went to praying for his soul. And to this day... The work he did, though he ripped me off, was still good. I, I had a, I took it, when I was in the sober living, I took in a bunch of guys and they were all addicts. They all went out while they were working, but I didn't know it. Smoking crack and whatever. But, um, you know, there was some good work done and whatever. And I'm, I'm able to, you know, forgive all that. And learn from my mistakes. You know, it's all about making mistakes and learning from them. Um, how much time do I have, Christine? Oh, okay. Well, you let me know when I have five, all right? Um, so, um, so you know, Robert did a great job of talking about what our minds do and, and, you know, but if I'm coming here loitering with the intention of getting sober, it's, it's not going to work. We can get time. There's guys with 30, 40 years and, but they're, they're about as dry as a brush. You light a match near them. They're going to go. Now, and that's no offense because they're better than they were, but it ain't doing me a favor when somebody's acting out and being miserable and being not a kind person. And so sobriety is more than abstinence from dr drugs and alcohol. Sobriety is sober thinking. It's soundness of mind. So in step one, I got here. I was defeated. I, you know, I'm in a tent in my living room. I came out of compliance. 
I knew I was powerless. I didn't think alcohol was a problem. But as I started to read, you know, the information, and, and when I was in there, there was a guy in rehab that died from liver poisoning, you know, from uh, cirrhosis. And, and uh, I just started to see how serious this was. And I believed what the big book says, you know. And uh, thank you for reading Chapter 3, you know, more about alcoholism. Because, you know, none of us like to admit that we're real alcoholics and that we're bodily and mentally different than our fellows. And that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that this is the case. Like, if you have any lurking, if you have gone out and you're here, many, some of you are here at this home here and you're kind of in compliance. Many people come because the wife's going to leave them, the job's going to fire them, they got a DUI, whatever the reason. We get here, we don't come here out of virtue. Our literature says we come here out of circumstance. And, you know, and, and the thing is, is, um, you know, I have to fully concede that I can never drink successfully again. I can never use successfully again. Though my mind says, oh, well, you know, maybe, you know, but um, you didn't have a, really a problem with pot. Now it's legal, you know. But, you see, my life is so good now. I don't need that. I, I work with a lot of men and women all over the world because this method I do, I'm, I'm, my, my speaking is on this website, and it goes all over, and people call me through Messenger or wherever, and, you know, they say, hey, we don't have a good meeting, you know, I like what you're saying, would you work with me? And the steps are the steps when they're taken, you know, um, and, you know, they're on the wall there, but, you know, I admitted I was powerless over alcohol. It's the only time alcohol is mentioned in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm powerless over women, sex, gambling, cigarettes, money, there's a lot of programs. They all deal with that first half of step one. What we talk about in this primetime group, there's a dash that my life had become unmanageable. Well, I got here. I was in a tent in my living room, crashing cars, whatever. My life was pretty unmanageable. But now, I'm, I'm like a year sober, and I'm ready to blow my brains out. You see, the alcohol was my solution. Not The two treatments for alcoholism, one is alcohol. It works great. Unfortunately, it has a lot of symptoms you know usually you know we break out in handcuffs or something like that right but but uh that wasn't my case but but you see if you're not sure you're an alcoholic it's really simple it says if when you sincerely want to you find you can't quit entirely or if when drinking you can't control the amount you drink you're probably an alcoholic and if that be the case you suffer from an illness they didn't call it a disease now you suffer from an illness which only a spiritual experience can conquer. So it's a spiritual solution because we were drinking liquid spirits. We were smoking spirits to lift our spirits so that we could live in this world. I'm a depressive. I was self-medicating for years. Now you take my medicine. How am I supposed to live with these feelings in this mind that just won't shut up? So, you know, the step, I need something sufficient a message of substance and weight. And what happens with the 12 steps in an order form? They help to produce a new way of thinking with no reference to the old. The old guy's still there. I was talking to this gentleman here. You know, self can never go away. But what it is, instead of the old self, the lower self, small s, I'm trying to build a new self, the capital S, the higher self. What is that? Well, my whole problem has been the misuse of willpower. Whatever this God is, gave us free will and will not mess with it. Matter of fact, it's the fall of man. Free will. You know, we, we were given the Garden of Eden. Just don't eat the damn apple, right? And we had to have the apple. It's never enough. Because the ego, and we have what's called an infantile ego. There was a doctor back in AA's Pioneer Time named Dr. Harry Tebow. He's mentioned in the back of the big book, but there's a whole bunch of papers on him. And he, he studied us when we were new. And he saw a trait we all had, called it an infantile ego, and that we're always in a hurry. We're, we're defiant. We don't like to be told what to do. We, we, we're, we're, we, we hate the word no. You know, um, you know, grandiosity, omnipotence. I'm playing God. So it's not working anymore, but it's really hard to turn it over. You know, and I can turn it over for alcohol. Yeah, I come to this program. Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. It's great. There's a power greater than ourselves working through us. 
We get to share. We get to be there for each other. But whatever that power is, and again, if don't let the God word scare you. The big book's so great. You don't need to believe in anybody else's concept of God. Your own concept, however inadequate, is sufficient to make the approach. And so the whole idea in step two, the main paragraph is, do I now believe? Maybe you don't. Or am I willing to believe, you see? If I say I will not believe, you might as well go home. I mean, it requires something greater than any human power. I call it God. It used to be a different picture of God. Now, I, I don't even know what it is, but I have the absolute certainty that it is. And because it's doing for me that which I could never do for myself. And and, and it's in, it's miraculous. And I see it all the time. The stuff that happens and the way I'm able to help people and the way I'm able to get through situations that used to baffle, you know. Um, so, so in step one, I need to surrender. You know, it says, um, under the lash of alcoholism, I am driven to AA. And there I discover the fatal nature of my situation. Sober. And then and only then do I become as open-minded to conviction and willing to listen as the dying can be. I see some of you here looking, you know, and maybe you're listening. Maybe you're listening with your ears. Hopefully, you know, you're taking it in. It's hard. Uh, being right here, right now, in this moment, God, could you help me to listen? Because I'm judging the shit out of this mother. And, and, I, and, I, and I'm thinking about my car needs to get fixed. I'm thinking about what she said to me earlier. You know, the bills I got to pay. And it's really hard to stay focused because, you know, listening is a really selfless act. Yeah, you know, you you having a conversation with me. I'm thinking about what I'm going to say. I'm not, you know, I've learned to look at people in the eye and listen to them. Listen good. And remember, I, I do a lot of fist steps. I remember what somebody's saying. It, it might save their life. And uh, so, but that's not my nature. I'm a, I'm a selfish alcoholic. And it says the selfishness, It we must get rid of it. We must, or it kills us. And God makes that possible. No matter how much we wish or try on our own power, we had to have God's help. We can't do it. And, and, and I can't really forgive anybody neither. I have to ask this God to help me. Um, it's whatever God is. God just is. And I'm going to let it. I'm going to let myself be a vessel, a channel for that power to work through me to manifest in this three-dimensional earthly plane. That's what we are. That's what Alcoholics Anonymous is. God just is. God works slow, some evolution, whatever. To me, there's no problem with evolution and intelligent design. It's all so magnificent. The whole universe, we're spinning right now at 1,100 miles an hour, going around the sun about 60,000 miles an hour. The sun's moving around the Milky Way about, you know, 250 million miles an hour. You know, it's crazy. And then, and then the Milky Way is moving outward. It's beyond, that's just a matter world. You know, there's all this stuff called quantum entanglement. It's just ridiculous. I didn't, I know I didn't think of this shit. <laughs> this has got, you know, this it gives me hope. And I love science. I love what man's, and they, um, we, we've accomplished incredible things. But we are not the spearhead of evolution. And so I, I'm really grateful to have hit my bottom now because I found this way of living, a design for living that helps me to get through this stuff. God, two, going on three years now, I had to go back to Philadelphia. I was there six months. I took care of my father, who was dying of cancer. He died about a month later. And then my mother, who lived another month, uh, she's been sick for a while. But I was able to take care of them, be there for them, put them in the ground, make all the arrangements, get the, you know, it took me six months, clean every square inch of the three stories of home and all my report cards and every bill they ever pay. I mean, my dad, they just kept everything. But I did it with love. I didn't. I gave stuff to families that needed it, and they would send me pictures of my old bedroom with their two kids. In. You know, it was beautiful. I had two. My sister and I used to sleep. So, you know, and and I and then when I got done, my dad has a seven uh, an eighty five Pontiac Parisienne. I didn't want to get rid of it. He kept it in great shape. So I decided to drive it across the country, and to the chagrin of my mechanic, of the mechanic, and what I decided to do was make a road trip. And I went up and visited Akron and saw the rich history of AA and visited Dr. Bob's house and visited the archives and visited visited the chapel where uh, 
uh, uh, uh, Sister Ignatius was, and where Bill Bob worked with five thousand alcoholics, and uh, I saw Dr. Bob's grave, and I mean it it was a great it was so great, and then I visited some friends on the way, some friends in Kentucky, and I decided to see the solar eclipse. That was a really amazing experience, a total solar eclipse. You can take the glasses off, and for two minutes, it's the stars come out and the birds, stop, everything gets it's. And the little kids are going, oh. I mean, it was God. I, I, I'm looking forward to 2024. There's going to be another one. I'm going to find the best thing, check the weather. Like, it was amazing. And I stopped and, you know, I made the best out of it. And I came back and the demonstration was strong. I also went to AA back there and got myself in there. And I wound up speaking and people heard a message they never heard. Because they just talk about, don't drink no matter what, you know. And these people are dying. This isn't about don't drink no matter what. Yeah, if you don't drink, you won't get drunk. That's true. You know, uh, meeting goers get, or winners or whatever, but meetings alone aren't enough. I need it all. I need that triangle. I need the 12 steps of recovery as a foundation to help me to change. I need service and unity, the triangle. And when I do that in a day that I'm in, I'm complete. That's how the circle is complete. There's a lot of little sayings here, you know, um, you, you know, but so step one, when I get to that point, you know, I, I stand ready to do anything that will release the merciless obsession. I know I have a problem. What do I do? This rockets me into step two. I come to believe that something greater than any human power, something, you know, a higher power, they call it in step two, could, could restore me to sanity, which is defined as soundness of mind. You know, a sober decision doesn't necessarily mean you weren't drinking. It's a sound decision. So, um, and like I said, so in step two, I open my mind that there's a possibility. Like I said, am I willing to believe in a creative intelligence, a spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things? The minute I open my mind that that's a possibility, you know, I get, get begin to get results. And this is open to all. It's, it's totally inclusive, not exclusive. And so as long as you're sincere and provided with other simple steps, I mean, I believe God gave us these steps. They're, they're one of the greatest tools, uh, according to the Dalai Lama. You know, this is some incredible precise thing. But they need to be taken. I can't just read them. I, I need to, there's a process. It's done in a timely fashion in the big book. If you follow the big book, um, it's, it's done in a, a timely fashion. So, you know, you do your third step prayer, and then people wait a long time to do the fourth step. But right there it says, Though that decision was a vital and crucial step, getting on my knees and doing a third step prayer, it could have little permanent effect unless at once followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which have been blocking us. Our liquor was but a symptom, so we had to get down to causes and conditions. This started step four, which is to make a uh, searching and fearless moral inventory. But before we do that, we do have to make that decision and, and to turn our will, which is what we want. See, the free will is the problem. I've misused my willpower. And what I'm trying to do now is realign it with God's intention for me. What is God's will for us? We are sure he wants us to be happy, joyous, and free. God's will for us is always something vital and wonderful and better than anything we could think of for ourselves, provided we stay out of the way. See, we're all the children of God. God loves each one of us the same, no less, no more. And my ego, though, I am either the best or I'm the worst. I'm never one with anybody, you know. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I'm never a drunk among drunks, a worker among workers. But when I get that humility, because this is the, the whole thing is my ego is really bad, right? So I need to quell it. What quells that? Some pain. Pain is the touchstone of all spiritual. If you're struggling tonight with time, just know that it's the greatest motivator there is. Because in step one, only through utter defeat am I able to take my first steps towards liberation and strength. Our personal powerlessness finally turns out to be firm bedrock upon which happy and purposeful lives may be built. See, that's the good news. You know why? Why all the insistence every A must hit bottom first? Because I'd never do this thing. You wouldn't be here tonight if you just put the plug in the jug. You know, we're, we all come out of compliance to some degree, which means... I haven't really surrendered. I'm just, and this is what the word admit is. Admit, the, it means I do it reluctantly. I give this example a lot. You stole that, Craig? No, I didn't. You stole that, Craig? No, I didn't. Craig, we have you on video stealing that. 
Okay, I admit it. <laughs> you see, we, we don't come here, like, willingly. I, I got to... So I just want to get everybody off my back. The courts, the wife, the job, whatever. You know, in AA's primary time, they didn't let you in right away. They, they, they would interview you and your wife because they knew you had to be serious. That's why the recovery in the forward to the second edition was much stronger. It said 50% of the people went out and then another 25% came back and then even those that really tried would get it. Because they were more serious. Today we got court cards, we got kids, you know, we got people that haven't necessarily hit a bottom yet. And so the desperation is a big part of it. They wanted to make sure your, your liver was blown out, you were missing teeth. If you had a watch, you may not have hit a bottom yet. Your wife said, you gotta do something, I'm throwing him out of the house and he's losing everything. And then they, maybe you'd be willing enough. You know, they called them last gaspers, it says, and, uh, even these last gaspers, uh, had difficulty, but when they laid hold of the principles with all the fervor of a drowning man seizing a life preserver, they invariably got well. And so are you desperate now as a drowning man seizing a life preserver? These are principles. Are you will, willing to listen with the conviction of a dying man? You know, so when I do that, like I said, that rocks me into step two. And now I've got to start. I start talking to this power, whatever it is. I start opening my mind and looking and researching, reading things. And uh, and then in step three, I make that decision to turn my will, like I said, what I want, what I do with what I want, and my life. I confuse my life and my living. I think my living's the girl, the car, the job. That's, I mean, that, I think that's my life. But that's my living. That's the outside stuff. What we're trying to change here is, is the nature of our very being, who we are inside, the soul that lives for eternity. And this is about getting it right so that we can get the grace of God and help other people. You know, this whole thing are all promises. You know, you know the third step prayer, um, relieve me of the bondage of self, that I may better do your will, God. Take away my difficulties, that I can bear witness to others. I can show others that you took away my difficulties, they can take away yours too. And, you know, um, seven step prayer, um, you know, remove every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and others. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. There, there's conditions, see, uh, on page 53. He provided what we needed, if, I have my sponsors underline if, because it, it, it separates what God will do. He'll provide what we needed, if we kept close to him and performed his work well. I can't just do this for myself, and I can't do it for anybody else. All I can do is try to carry this message of the 12 steps of recovery and our truth that's in our literature so that you can have a shot, too. But it takes willingness. Thank you very much. Um, no, yeah, we've got five. If you're, if you're tired, I'll stop. <laughs> I, you know what? I wanted, I wanted to, I wanted to, you know, get, get me out of here, right? I hate it. I, I like, this was not for me. But now look at it. See, there's a passion here. You have to, this has to be a way of life. Eighth A's 12 steps are a group of principles, spiritual in their nature, which, if practiced as a way of life, can expel that obsession to drink and that obsession to think. <laughs> the way I do, and enable you and I, the sufferer, to become happily and usefully all. That's all I ever wanted. Robert didn't feel comfortable in his own skin. I was a depressive. And, ah, uh, okay, you know, happy hour. I, I would can't wait all day for happy hour. Matter of fact, I'd turn the clock up. I, I used to get together with some of the mothers and say, oh, well, we have to wait till 5, don't we, or then we're alcoholics. Well, somewhere it's 5 o'clock. Let's move the clock on. And they always love that. And we always would drink wine and we'd get lit. And, you know, and that's how I lived for many years. And people say, Craig, I didn't think you were an alcoholic. But they didn't know I was wound up in a tent in my living room. Um, you know, and it's a progressive disease. You know, we can quit on our own. For periods usually brief. Followed by still more pitiful and uncomprehensible. Because we're under the grip of a progressive illness. Over any considerable period, we get worse, never better. And there's a story of a guy that quit for 25 years. He wanted to be successful. And he became successful. This is a powerful lesson. And he decided to pick up his bedroom slippers and pick up that bottle where he left off. In two months, he was worse than ever. Now, his will was not... See, he was young enough. He might not have crossed the line. He had a willpower that would just with a desire. But now he couldn't stop. And I guess it was before AA. It's in the big book. I don't know what the reason, but he died in a couple of years. So it's this is progressive. And it's progressive sober. Like, my mind 
I need to do this. That's why I'm here tonight. With almost 18 years, what, 17 and a half, you know. It, it's, it's, I'm here tonight because my life depends on it. Our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depend on our constant thought of others and how we may best meet their needs. That's in the big book. You know, these are all truths. So there's, there's 12 steps in an order form. Four, I write down a lot of stuff. I see who I resent. I pray for them. I see who I wronged. I write my fears down. I do a sex inventory, sex ideal, and I discover my defects. I get with somebody, and I admit, uh, admit it to God, myself, and another human being, the exact nature of those defects, those shortcomings, those wrongs. And we do it the way the big book says. And then we go home for an hour, and we consider what we did, and, and we do six and seven. When I'm done, I say all my defects of character, which I have on a list that were, were given by my sponsor, and, and then I do my seven-step prayer. We have now completed step seven. It's really easy. A lot of people, I've been on step seven for two years now because my sponsor don't think that's what the 12 and 12. I mean, if you're, it, there's beautiful stuff in the 12 and 12, but this is a process. Eight and nine, I have the list already, and what, eight is just the willingness to make things right. I don't say I'm sorry to anybody. We don't crawl before anyone. We tell them what we did, why it was wrong, and that we're not that person anymore. And what can we, can we do to make it right? And in some cases, I ask for forgiveness. And, uh, and now I'm free of the past. I stay in 10. I can keep myself clean. Because if a tick lands on your arm and you watch it, it's going to dig in. But if I brush it right off, no harm done. That's what we, this is the Emmett Fox thing. Watch and pray, watch and pray. The first five seconds are golden. <clears throat> Don't let anything bother you too long or it will dig in and become a problem. And the 11th step has so much great stuff on awakening. When we retire at night, through the day, I could go on and on and on and on. But I know I've said a lot and the 12th step is our gift. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of those other 11 steps, which I've had, I try to carry this message. I don't know if anybody heard anything. It's really none of my business. I try to carry this message to other alcoholics, and I practice these principles in all my affairs, mostly my mental affairs, because I can be nice on the outside and be trashing you on the inside, and then I'm a big hypocrite. I don't want to be that person anymore. I want to be pure to myself. It's just me and God that matters. <clears throat> it's none of my business if you're judging. It's none of my business. So uh, it's a great way to live. I don't have to change you anymore. It only matters what I think and what I do. I only have to change me. I have a part in everything. Anyway, thank you so much for letting me share. And um, I hope God bless you guys. Stay with this thing and embrace it. You know, know that, accept that you're an alcoholic. Don't say why. Accept it and, and embrace it and do this thing. Anyway, thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.